Well, I shall introduce Liam. My name's Marcus Gibbs. I'm a physics teacher at the Royal Hospital School. And um, so, yeah, we're a group of, a, group, there's several of us on the committee and we, we try, try and invite good, good speakers every year. Um, tonight's speaker is Liam Stubbington. That's, Liam's a radiotherapy physicist, now employed at Cambridge University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. A little bit of background about Liam. So Liam studied maths, further maths, physics and chemistry at A-level uh, before reading physics at Exeter, I think you went to. Yeah, so um, he then spent three and a half enjoyable years at Durham University, soft, University's soft matter fluorescence microscopy lab uh, while completing a PhD. I think I got the words right, that's a, okay. And before, before enrolling on the National School of Healthcare Scientist Training Programme, well worth looking at that. I'd really sort of recommend that to people doing A-level physics at the moment, just yeah, really worth having a look at. Liam graduated from the scheme earlier this year with an MSc in uh, Clinical Sciences and Medical Physics, and is now a registered clinical scientist. Now, Liam's gonna be talking to us about modern radiotherapy. It's developed a lot over the, over the years. Um, as Maria was saying earlier, if you've got questions, we're not going to take questions during the talk, but what, what I'll do is I'll field questions. Um, if you put questions and any questions you've got into the Q and A, um, then what I'll do is field them to Liam, um, at the end of, end of his, end of his talk. So, um, without further ado, I shall hand over to Liam. Thank you very much. Right, thank you for that lovely introduction, Marcus. Um, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be here, uh, so thank you for having me. I'm just going to launch into a screen share now. Um, okay, so I think we're in the room now. This is my talk. It's going to be on modern radiotherapy. Now, modern radiotherapy, the objective of modern radiotherapy is to deliver a therapeutic dose of ionizing radiation to the tumour to eradicate or alleviate disease. The thing I'm going to be talking about principally tonight is external beam radiotherapy, um, and that's where the source of X rays is typically a, a particle accelerator, as opposed to what you discussed just recently with Lisa in the tutorial, which is um, gamma rays. We're going to be talking about X rays, um, and they are the same thing. It's just that X rays originate from outside the nucleus, uh, and gamma rays originate from the nucleus of the atom. But I did just mention. Uh, these these X-rays come from a particle accelerator. And I'll just let that sink in for a minute. We have a particle accelerator in the hospital. We actually have several of them in most hospitals. So uh, external beam radiotherapy looks something like this. It's delivered by a linear accelerator. Uh, the patient lies on a support system, called, which we call the couch, which is complete with immobilization aids to keep them still. The radiation comes out of the treatment head um, and the... Um, the radiation beam is generated in something called the gantry, which is able to rotate 360 degrees about the patient. Um, oh, I might be able to put the laser pointer on, that might help. Yes, so the gantry is able to rotate 360 degrees around the patient. Uh, most modern accelerators are also equipped with onboard imaging equipment. And we have here a, a kilovoltage X-ray tube, uh, which is used to take planar projection images. Exactly, you know, you might have been unfortunate enough to go to hospital to have uh, uh, an image of your hand or your foot or your leg or your chest. Um, we can take projections at multiple angles and, and reconstruct those into a 3D image of the patient anatomy on set. Uh, and most of them also have something called a portal imager, which lets us detect the radiation that's passing right through the patient as a means of verifying the dose that we've delivered. So for those of you that don't like simulations, I thought I might just set myself up on a treatment couch. Um, just, you know, just to sort of ram home the point that this is not all in silico this does actually really happen so this is me on one of the elector machines here at cuh and i've got a slightly a slight video showing you the various components of the linac and how they revolve around the patient in order to deliver the x-rays so again um the radiation comes out of the the treatment head aperture these are the imaging arms um and as you can see the whole assembly uh, rotates about the patient uh, de delivering the dose So I have to thank my colleague, Anita Anthony, for helping me prepare these videos earlier this week. So 
the whole treatment itself might look something like this. Now, this is a video that I've pulled off of YouTube, but I think it, it demonstrates the principle of an arc therapy quite nicely. Um, so the machine head itself, the radiation beam is sculpted by these, these things called MLCs, which are high atomic number material that move in and out of the beam to shape the beam during delivery to the shape of the tumor. The, the LINAC itself rotates around the patient uh, and in this way, uh, where all these beams, these multiple beams intersect from different gantry angles, we deliver, we build up a high dose of the tumor whilst sparing critical structures. And that's a bit of a mouthful, so we're going to unpack that over the course of the next few slides. But before I do that, I do need to give you a little disclaimer, and that is that this talk is not actually complete. There are other areas of radiotherapy, notably brachytherapy, which is uh, the use of gamma ray sources. Um, which you position next to or within the tumor itself. And that area of radiotherapy is really worth of an hour's lecture completely on its own. And on top of that, medical physics is a diverse and really exciting, fascinating field with many sub-disciplines. We've got diagnostic radiology, which includes magnetic resonance or MRI, ultrasound, CT, planar X-rays, as I've already mentioned a little bit. Um, and we've also got nuclear medicine, which includes PET and single photon emission computer tomography, and also molecular radiotherapy. And on top of that, there is the sub-discipline of clinical engineering. So my hope is that I do a reasonable job here tonight, uh, and the, 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 the people on the panel at the Cavendish will invite back uh, one of my medical physics colleagues in, in one of these sub-disciplines, and perhaps they can do a talk on one of these fields uh, at a later date. For those of you who want to know a little bit more about medical physics, I thoroughly recommend checking out the IPEM website. That's the Institute of Physics and Engineering and Medicine. Affiliate membership is free for all of you lot. Um, and on top of that, there is the Institute of Physics Medical Physics Group. Uh, I think IOP associate membership is something like £15 a year. Um, and that will give you access to Physics World. Uh, and you can, you can actually become a student contributor at Physics World. Um, which is something that I, I highly recommend. It's always full of insightful stuff and it's a great way to get a feel for what's going on in, in the field of medical physics. The second and really important disclaimer that I want to give is that cancer care is a multidisciplinary team effort, all right? The, 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 um, you know, that there's many different skill sets involved in the delivery of high quality, effective cancer care, of which radiotherapy is a part. And that includes oncologists, doctors, nurses, treatment radiographers, physicists, dissymmetrists, service managers, administrative staff and support staff. They all have a key and equal and valid role to play, um, and it couldn't be done without any one of those professions. But we're here to, to mainly talk about physics today because this, this is a celebration of physics. So just a quick outline of the external beam radiotherapy patient journey. It begins with referral. So the, 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 it's decided that the patient needs radiotherapy as part of their treatment. Uh, the doctor gives them a prescription and uh, the patient is then consented. We will then, modern radiotherapy is, is, is image guided. So we'll have a localization CT scan, which we use a CT scanner to, to build a 3D model of the patient. And that's by, by imaging the patient using a CT scanner. And on that CT scan, we'll have um, the, the target for the radiotherapy and also any critical structures which are near to the target are delineated by either the oncologist or uh, a trained dosimetrist. The next stage is treatment planning and plan optimization, and that's when we choose the set of gantry angles for the LINAC and the set of MLC apertures to conform to the tumor in order to deliver uh, the dose. Um, then delivery, which is, is broken down into several fractions. So you might have uh, a, a fraction of radiotherapy delivered on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, a break for the weekend, and you'll come back for, for a period of weeks. Uh, and then after that, when your course is complete, there'll be further follow-up imaging uh, and outcomes and monitoring of the, of the patient response and, and further treatment if it's necessary, but hopefully not. So the outline for the rest of the talk is going to be quite, quite. I'm going to move at quite a quick pace. We've got quite a lot to get through. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is radiobiology, and I'm going to talk about the, the therapeutic properties of ionizing radiation uh, and how we can use them to to treat disease. Uh, and then we're going to talk about particle acceleration in the hospital. Uh, we're going to talk about medical electron acceleration and producing a useful X-ray beam. Uh, the, the next stage is kind of very key, important element of it all is it's a symmetry, which is measuring the radiation dose. Um, we're then going to go on to treatment planning, which is optimization of machine parameters, as I've just mentioned. And then if there's time, which I really hope there will be, we're going to talk about some things that are on the cutting edge of radiotherapy. We're going to talk about proton beams. Uh, so that's different from x-rays. We're actually using protons to treat tumors. 
Uh, and then finally, we're going to end with um, some really advanced onboard imaging to help guide the, the treatment delivery on set. So let's begin with radiobiology and the therapeutic properties of ionizing radiation. Now, the key thing is X-rays set charged particles in motion when they pass through tissue. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, I thought we might we might do a simulation uh, to demonstrate that. And I believe Maria is going to take over shortly. I just want to collect this. This simulation package is called RADSIM. Um, it's freely available. Just Google RADSIM. It's a great tool for an educational tool for demonstrating uh, fundamental subatomic particle interactions. And it's, it's really insightful. It lets you simulate the, the various interactions that are going on. So, Maria, are we are we able to um, if I stop share a minute, are we able to, to do a quick uh, takeover to just to demonstrate RADSIM in the background? Right. I'm trying. I'm trying to get no. RADSIM up. But Don't worry about I, it. We can. We I can should, hang that. on. I get it going, but I struggle. Um, to, sh I'll I'll try. I'll give it a whirl. So Compton effect first. Is that the one you want first? Yes, please. Yeah. So if I stop right. sharing for a minute, we should. Okay. Um, and I've, the trouble is that I can't. I can't minimise the screen. Um, Don't worry about it. I prepared a backup. We got we got plenty yeah, of time. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll take control again. Yeah, um, I think it's safest. Right. Okay. So what are you seeing now? Has that gone into presenter mode? Yeah. Okay. So um, I've. I, I, th I thoroughly recommend uh, those of you that can, you check out this free educational tool. It's a, a great thing for teachers. You can uh, you can look at the, the various distributions of particle energies and angles and scattering angles and all sorts of things. Uh, and it makes the whole thing feel a lot more real. Um, and it's totally free. Uh, so Compton scatter is the dominant interaction that we are interested in for, for radiotherapy. Uh, and, and the instant X-ray X -ray collides with an electron orbital uh, and the recoil electron is ejected. Now, the key thing is, is that ejection of that electron, that electron then goes on to cause further excitation and ionization events. And it's this excitation and ionization that leads to energy deposition in the patient. Um, that, that energy deposition we call absorbed dose. And we give it the units of gray. So if I ever mention gray, that's just the units of dose throughout the rest of this talk. And the SI units of that is the joule per kilogram. Now, this dose, this energy, these, these, these charged particles passing through matter can interact with important biomolecules like DNA. And when that interaction occurs, we can, we, we can render the cell unviable. And that's what we're principally using to, to destroy tumors. And we know this works because we can take Petri dishes of, of cell lines uh, and we can irradiate them to, to different levels uh, and then count the number of colonies that then subsequently grow after being irradiated. And we get these kind of curves. You know, if we take a dose, we take a Petri dish uh, and we irradiate it to a high dose and then to B, which is slightly lower, and then to C, which is slightly lower still. Uh, sorry, uh, we irradiate Petri dish A to a, hot, to a low dose, then slightly increase the dose and then slightly increase the dose further and compare it to a control that we didn't irradiate at all. We end up with something called the surviving fraction. Now, all of these curves collapse onto a curve of a mathematical form, which is similar to this here. Uh, it's an exponential relation. Not actually interested for the purpose of this talk exactly what that is. I just, all I want to do is, is for you to know that we, as we increase the dose, we end up with more cell kill. But remember that this absorbed dose that causes cell death is actually only a surrogate for patient outcomes. What we're interested in in the hospital is not the amount of energy that was delivered to the patient. We're, we're interested in the probability of disease control. So we need a model that relates the dose and dose response. And what we're going to do tonight is we're actually just going to do a very, very simple one, a very crude one. Uh, and we're going to say that we, for, for tumor control, we need the probability that no clonogenic tumor cells survive as a function of dose. So if we assume that a tumor has n clonogenic cells, then the mean number of cells surviving a total dose D is equal to the number of cells in the tumor multiplied by our surviving fraction that we looked at previously. Now, the probability that an individual cell survives is small and the number of cells in a tumor is very large. So we're in the remit of Poisson statistics. Um, 
And what we're interested in really is the probability that no cell survives. So that's this Poisson statistics function uh, f of zero, which is just e to the minus mean number of cells surviving. And we end up with a complicated formula, which I've sketched here. It's a very crude model of tumor control probability, but it does retain some of the important characteristics of, of the nature of these models. And that is that at low dose, we get no tumor control effect. But then at some point, the whole thing switches on and we end up with tumor control. And, and all of these, these tumor control probability curves have a form similar to that. Real clinical data, as I've shown here for some from prostate cancer data here, tends to be much more smeared out. You can see that the curve is nowhere near as steep. But the key thing is we can also formulate similar models for the complication of normal tissue control probability. So all these charged particles that we've released in matter are, can be used to kill tumor, but they also have an effect on normal healthy tissue that they're passing through. And that's the key thing. So we end up, we arrive at this, com this, um, this concept of uncomplicated control probability, which is the product of tumor control probability times one minus the normal tissue complication probability. And we end up with this curve. And this is, this is, this is what I'm getting at here. This probability of achieving um, controlling the disease without unwarranted or unsolicited side effects occurs over a very narrow range of dose. And th this, is, this is where the role of, of radiotherapy physics comes in. We're, we're here to, to ensure that the treatment is as much as possible at the peak of this curve. And we're, we're, we're delivering a, th a therapy that um, has the highest probability of tumor control with the, with the lowest probability of unsolicited side effects. So we can further refine the objective of the modern radiotherapy that I gave earlier, and that is to deliver a therapeutic dose of ionizing radiation to the tumor in line with the clinical goal, that is to control disease. But on top of that, the treatment should be optimized. We should have maximum tumor control probability with minimal normal tissue complication. That is what the goal of modern radiotherapy is. So how do we produce x-rays in a hospital? All right, here we go. We already know that x-rays can be used to alleviate or eradicate disease, right? So what energy x-rays do we need? That seems like a sensible uh, question to start with. The deepest sites in the human body are of the order of 15 to 30 centimeters, probably in the pelvis. And we wanna aim for about 50% beam attenuation at the target. If we go any higher than that, then we risk overdosing critical structures that lie beneath the target. And any less than that, we'll be inherently wasteful with our x-rays. X-rays are characterized by their penetrative power or their energy. And that's sort of summarized in this parameter called the mass attenuation coefficient, which is related to the thickness of absorber that's necessary to reduce the flux of X-rays at the detector beyond the source. In the, so you, you look at the, the ratio of the flux of X-rays in the presence of the absorber and without the absorber, and, and how much that flux is reduced is related to the mass attenuation coefficient. This data is freely available. Uh, I took this from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, uh, and I plotted it here. Um, and for uh, sort of 50% attenuation in 15 to 30 centimeters of water, we're looking at X-rays with an energy of around five to 15 mega electron volts. So we need X-rays of the order of five to 15 mega electron volts. The easiest way to produce electrons on demand is through a process known as bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation. Uh, at this point, I was gonna break and do another RADSIM demo, but since we can't do that, I encourage you to go and check it out in your own time. The thing about bremsstrahlung is the electrons, the, the, the fast moving electrons interact with the Coulomb field of the nuclei of the target material. And if the target is high enough atomic number, the electrons will decelerate rapidly. And as they decelerate in that Coulomb field, they emit, they, they kick off their extra, excess energy in the form of X-rays. And that's the process that we use to generate X-rays in the hospital. Just, to, just a quick sort of remark here. We need electrons of energy of 5 to 15 MeV. And the rest mass of an electron is about half a mega electron volt. So electrons at 5 to 15 MeV are fully relativistic and they're moving at a speed that's very close to the speed of light. So most of their energy gain when they get up to that speed is actually being converted into mass energy. We're not actually accelerating the particle in a sense of it gaining speed, it's gaining mass. And just a quick note about bremsstrahlung, it's, it's highly inefficient, all right? It's not a very good way of producing x-rays, but it's all we've got. So um, I, I simulated in RADSIM, I did 10,000 instance, 10, 10 uh, mega electron volt electrons, only which about 8.4% of those electrons went on to produce photons, and the vast majority of which were of useless energy. Actually, only a small fraction of those photons 
were at the clinical energy that we're looking to deliver to the target. So clearly we need a structure that can produce electrons of 5 to 15 MeV, uh, and it needs to supply a large enough beam current to support clinical dose rates. A simple naive approach to do that would be to borrow what they use in diagnostic uh, x-rays, which is to have um, a, a series of plates uh, with a potential difference applied between them. And we know that a charged particle in, a, in, a, um, in an electric field will sustain a force and therefore accelerate. So the electron will accelerate from, uh, I've actually drawn this the wrong way around, sorry, that, that will accelerate from the negative plate toward the positive plate. Unfortunately, a potential difference of 10 mega electron volts is entirely unsustainable. We'd end up building our own little lightning chamber in the, uh, in the lab, which is much fun as it sounds, it's probably not safe in the hospital. So the simple idea is, okay, we can't do it in one go, but why don't we give the electron a, a series of small kicks and accelerate them, accelerate them up to speed or, or up to mass that way? Um, and what we do is we apply an oscillating potential difference between a series of plates. So we have positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And then the simple idea is that the electrons, as they enter this, this accelerating structure, if we can time the phase or, or the, um, if we can time the phase of the oscillating potential just right, as the electron enters cavity one, it'll feel an accelerating force. Then as it transfers to cavity two, the phase of the oscillating potential flips and the, the negative plates become positive and the electron again feels an accelerating force. And this continues right the way through this accelerating waveguide structure until we achieve the energy of the electron that we are aiming to do. Now, a, a key thing is, is it would be nice to be able to supply that um, oscillating potential difference using wires. But unfortunately, if we say, for instance, the plate separation in our waveguide is five centimeters and they're traveling at approximately the speed of light, this means we need 3000 megahertz um, oscillating potential. Now that's radio frequency electromagnetic radiation. So we can't use wires because the wires will behave like an antenna. So the thing that we go about that is we use a, a power transmission or an RF waveguide to couple in that oscillating field into our accelerating structure. And now you're, you're equipped to, to, to understand the, the key elements that we need to, to an accelerate a, an electron uh, up to five to 15 MeV in a hospital. We need a source of electrons and that's reasonably simple. We just heat up uh, a cathode and they will essentially boil off. Um, They'll enter the accelerating waveguide, uh, which experiences an oscillating RF field, which is coupled in by an RF power transmission waveguide. And then at the end, once they've reached that acceleration, um, once they've reached the desired energy, they slam into a tungsten target. And as they break in the Coulomb field of the tungsten atoms, we end up with our X-ray beam. Of course, there is actually a lot more to it than that. Uh, that notably here, um, Lisa did talk about cooling at CERN, uh, and that's a big part of an electron accelerator because uh, these accelerating waveguides tend to be made of copper and copper heats up. Uh, it's got, sorry, copper changes dimensions when it expands and that changes the frequency of RF that you need to apply. So cooling is very important. Uh, and equally, we need a vacuum system in the accelerating waveguide such that the mean free path of the electron is much longer than the waveguide itself because we want it to actually hit the target before it gets scattered by material in the waveguide. Um, but this is a sort of a reasonable schematic of a, of a medical electron accelerator. And the bit that I haven't really talked about yet is the, the beam shaping apparatus, which is really important. All right? um, and the thing we're going to focus on today, because there's lots of things that we use to shape the beam, actually. But the thing that is perhaps of principal interest is this thing called the multi-leaf collimators. And I've got a video from my, my wonderful colleague uh, or, or former colleague, Lara, at the uh, at Ipswich Hospital. Uh, treatment radiographer made this and I think it it demonstrates the principle of, of uh, field shaping using multi-leaf collimators really really nicely. So in the head of the treatment accelerator there are approximately 120 individual leaves. Uh, they're of high atomic number material so they absorb the x-ray radiation and they move in and out of the radiation field dynamically um, during, during delivery or statically to, to conform the radiation field to the shape of the tumour. Uh, this is a lovely video, I think. So this is the, this is the collimator. This is the treatment head that you're looking into here. The collimator has 360 degrees rotation as well. Uh, and these are the MLCs moving in and out of the light field, which is a surrogate for the X-ray field when we're doing verification of what we're about to deliver to the patient. So I'm hoping 
um, because we are short pressed for time. I'm not going to be able to show this all the way to the end, but I'm hoping you can guess out that the uh, the MLC apertures are going to spell out radiotherapy. So I thank you, Lara, for that video. It's 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 rather lovely. So. Um, the next topic, I told you we're going to have to move quickly here because there's not a lot of time. We've got to cover an awful lot of ground um, is dosimetry, which is measuring radiation dose. We've already discussed the fact that X-rays can be used to eradicate or alleviate disease. And we've talked about how Linux can be used to generate X-rays on demand in a clinical environment. Measuring dose is clearly a key component of the uncomplicated control probability mix. Right? We need to know what this parameter is and we need to know it well. And that's well within the remit of physics. We're used to measurement. Right? These co next couple of slides are all about measurement. So X-rays set charged particles in motion when passing through tissue. I think you might know, you might know that by now. Um, and these charged particles dissipate their energy and matter. Uh, and this leads to the concept of absorbed dose. It turns out that charge is very easy to measure, but dose isn't. All right. So just bear with me a minute. There's two important detectors that form the backbone of dosimetry in the UK. All right? There's a graphite calorimeter, which measures dose directly. And then there's a graphite walled air cavity ionization chamber. It doesn't necessarily have to be an NE2571. I'm sorry I've left that in there, uh, which is capable of measuring charge. If we just go through the, the principles of calorimetry, which again, I think came up in Lisa's tutorial. So this is all connected. Um, calorimetry basically says that the dose or the energy absorbed per unit mass is related to the temperature change of the material and the constant of proportionality is the specific heat capacity. So dose deposition generates a tiny local temperature change in our absorber. Now, um, I'm actually gonna skip over this, but this slide is basically telling you that we need to use graphite because the temperature change uh, when water is the absorber volume is, uh, too, is just too small. It's only slightly bigger for graphite, but it gives us a chance to at least measure it. Uh, this is a photo of a, of a graphite calorimeter, um, and this is some photos of a graphite calorimeter in, uh, in action. Uh, and hopefully you can get from these experiments that they tend to be quite elaborate and unwieldy experiments. Uh, they're not really appropriate for doing in a hospital. You, know, you, you say, oh, I need to check the radiation that's coming out of the machine. I've got patients this afternoon. Oh, hang on a minute. I need about six weeks to set my experiment up. It's not good enough. So we need something much simpler. And that's where the ionization chamber comes in. It's a very humble instrument. This is it here. This is the, this is the sort of the, the, uh, the connecting wire. Uh, and this is the graphite uh, chamber that you can just see down here. And this is the electrometer that's used to collect the charge that's separated in the chamber volume when radiation passes through it. Let's just unpack that last sentence a little bit here. I've got this, uh, this wonderful figure from a paper here, which is a, a Monte Carlo simulation of x-rays passing through a, um, uh, an air cavity ionization chamber. Uh, in, in here, you've got uh, t uh, sort of a thousand six megavoltage uh, electron voltage photons uh, passing through the chamber cross section. Uh, and this shows you the secondary particle tracks. So this is yet more evidence of X-ray setting charge particles in motion. So this is all the electrons that the photons have kicked off. Uh, and then in C and D, we forced the photons to produce more um, charged particles in the, the, the absorber volume or, or within the graphite wall of, of the chamber. So the chamber basically, um, it, it, there's a potential difference applied between uh, two electrodes. Uh, and as the charge is separated in the air volume, those ions are sucked towards uh, the, the opposite polarity electrode and the electrometer turns that into a charge reading. But the key thing is calorimetry is unwieldy, it requires expertise and complex equipment. Chambers, on the other hand, are quick, simple, reliable and robust. So the simple idea is, what if we use the chamber measurement to recover what the calorimeter would have measured under identical conditions? So we set our LINAC up in exactly the same way. We irradiate the calorimeter and we measure the dose. And then we do the exact same thing. We irradiate the chamber, and we measure the charge, and we take the ratio of those two values. Suddenly, we've got a way of guaranteeing that five gray in Aberdeen is the same as five gray in Aberystwyth. Um, I might have butchered that pronunciation, apologies. But th this, is a, this is a key idea and it's, it's such a wonderfully simple thing and it's employed all over the world. You have, a, you have a, a primary standards laboratory, which is the MPL in the UK, which manage your graphite calorimeters. Uh, and you send away your ionization chamber from your hospital and they give you a factor that converts the chamber charge 
to the calorimetry. It's a wonderfully simple idea and it's so important to consistent and safe and effective radiotherapy. The other thing about ionization chambers is we can also make them very small uh, and we can attach them to remote stepper arms and put them in something called the water tank. And that's a very key instrument because it's the only thing that we can really know for sure. All right, it's the zeroth approximation of a patient. Um, I know it doesn't look anything like a patient, but human tissue is essentially water. So we fill this chamber with water. We have an ionization chamber about there. and We attach it to several stepper motors. And this allows us to make measurements of the beam, the radiation beam that's coming out of the accelerator in two or at least uh, sorry three independent axes we can measure a percentage depth dose or we can measure a profile along the two cross planes or the in planes and this is very important because i've set this up in in something called the treatment planning system which is like our our means of calculating dose in the patient remember i said that the patient has a ct scan we need a model that lets us calculate the dose within the patient absorber volume um, and this allows us to compare calculations so here we've got calculations of percentage depth dose with measurements. We can measure a percentage depth dose and we can calculate a percentage depth dose. And when we compare the two, we are exactly doing physics, all right? We have, we have, we have measurements and we have calculations and we appraise the two with respect to each other. And if we've done our job properly, we'll have what we know as a beam model. Just briefly, before I go on to talk about um, uh, planning and optimization of machine parameters. I just want to talk about some other detectors of note. Uh, you can get 2D uh, array, uh, arrays of ionization chambers, uh, which allow us to measure dose in a plane. There's this wonderful stuff called gaffchromic film, which is a, a polymer film that changes color with absorbed dose. It's bloody marvelous. All right, so what I've done here is I've irradiated strips of gaffchromic film to a known dose. Uh, each this, this is increasing dose. This is low dose all the way through to high dose, and you can see it gets more blue. Uh, and this allows me to draw up a calibration curve of optical density versus dose. Uh, and then we can use that to, to measure dose distributions in 2D. Um, so, just as I was saying, we have a beam model now. The, the next thing that we need to consider, if we, if we, we just recap for a minute well, before we start talking about treatment planning, X-rays can be used to eradicate or alleviate disease. Linear accelerators can be used to generate X-rays on demand in a hospital setting. And ionization chambers let us measure the dose. We're very nearly there now, all right? The only thing we haven't talked about is the sparing of critical structures and how we choose the set of gantry angles, the set of MLC leaf apertures, the set of collimator angles that will deliver a dose distribution that is clinically satisfactory. Recall that the machine has a large number of parameters available. Uh, we've got the MLCs, something called the X-ray jaws, which doesn't talk about gantry angle, collimator angle, uh, and we can also play with the dose rate, which is how much radiation we choose to pump in from a given gantry angle. This is an extremely large parameter space, all right? So what I've got here is I've got a, a, I obviously can't show you any real life patient data, so don't worry. This is a physics simulation. This is a model of a male, uh, uh, a male human, a human male pelvis. Uh, and I've added a single field and I've used, um, sorry. So this is a model of a male human pelvis. We've got a bone model here. We've got a rectal model here. We've got a bladder and we've got a prostate. Our target is the prostate. So I've added a single field, which is conformed to the shape of the prostate. And I've calculated the dose, all right? And we can see that this is reasonably good uh, in, the, in the coronal plane. You know, we, we're, we're, we're not irradiating too much tissue outside the prostate in this plane. But if we look at the other planes, we can see quite clearly that the dose is maximal in front of the target before decreasing to, to a, um, you know, still reasonably high at the point of a critical structure uh, of the rectum. So this is clearly not good enough. And if you want quantitative footing, I've put a line profile on here just to demonstrate. Um, we have uh, approximately 67% uh, of the prescription dose at the point of the rectum, which is too high. We'll end up with too high normal tissue complication probability. So naively, we could add, okay, let's, let's add four fields. And if we do that uh, at four different gantry angles, we can see that we're doing better. We have a brick of, of high dose here, which surrounds the prostate, all right? So this is a color map of the dose, uh, blue being low and red being high. And we can see a brick of high dose that encompasses the prostate. But unfortunately, again, we still have at least 50% of the prescription dose at the point of our organ at risk, which is the rectum in this case. If you recall this video that I showed at the start, um, you'll remember that 
most modern radiotherapy is actually delivered in an arc. We have we exploit every possible gantry angle, and we just the we adjust the MLC aperture to suit at the gantry angle that we 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 tend to be at. Uh, and hopefully it's clear now that the logical extension of going from one field to four field is to then to go for an infinite number of fields, or essentially infinite. Uh, and when we when we arrive at, at this uh, space, we, we end up with a very large parameter space and we need to set it would be unwieldy for us as human beings to to choose each one of the machine parameters by ourselves. So what we need to do is we need to condition the problem so that the computer, uh, our computers can interpret what it is we want from them um, and understand what it is that we're trying to do and, and back out a set of machine parameters that match. And the way we do that is we digest uh, the the sort of the, the dose distribution that we want into a simple cost function in terms of dose. Now this is quite um, elaborate. Uh, I don't really want to go in too much into this, but the, basically the cost function is a dumb number representing plan quality. All right. So the cost function itself will increase if a beam aperture from a particular gantry angle with a particular MLC shape uh, adds to the dose in a forbidden region for instance, the rectum, or it will decrease if a new beam avoids organs at risks and adds to the target dose in a favorable way. Um, and then the process is quite simple, right? It's, it's well conditioned for a computer. We start with an initial guess at the machine parameters. We calculate the dose using our beam model. We evaluate our cost function, modify the machine parameters, and then update the, the calculated dose and cost function. And then we either reject or accept the change. And this is the process of inverse planning, right? The cycle repeats until we land at a set of machine parameters that we consider acceptable. And this runs through something called um, the optimizer, uh, which is you know, this is this is the space where you set up your your objectives for your dose distribution, um, and this is where you monitor the value of your cost function over time. And when the optimizer is finished running, we end up with a dose distribution that looks something like this. Now, notice how this is completely conformal in the high dose region to the prostate region. That's exactly what we want. The high dose is going exactly where we want it, and similarly, the the optimizer has managed to derive a set of um, machine parameters that have scooped the the 25% um, prescription isodose away from the rectum. This is maximizing our chances of uncomplicated control, all right, and which is what we're here to do. So I hope that was clear. There'll be time to talk about that at the end. Um, if we if if we should if we we should uh, appreciate I've gone through that quite quickly and uh, inverse planning is is a, is a marvelous thing. But let's just recap. OK, so X-rays can be used to eradicate or alleviate disease. All right. Linear accelerators can be used to generate X-rays on demand in a hospital setting. Ionization chambers allow us to measure dose easily and conveniently in the hospital. And we've talked about inverse planning, which allows us to spare healthy tissue. It allows us to, to deliver beams to the target and deliver only a minimal number of beams to organs at risk. Is there anything else that we can do to improve our chances of a successful outcome? And this is where I'm going to move on and start talking about something that's slightly beyond my remit, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Uh, and that's proton beam therapy. You might have heard of proton beam therapy. Um, it's the idea of itself isn't actually uh, anything new. It's been around since about 1946. Um, but the NHS has actually got two of these these proton beam uh, centers now. There's one up in, in, in Manchester uh, and there's another one down at UCLH. There might be some advantages of using another form of subatomic particle that we haven't explored yet. If we just go back to photons and we think that the interaction is dominated by uh, Compton, uh, the interaction cross-section is dominated by Compton interactions, and this is such that the energy of a, of a, the, the energy of a photon passing through tissue is lost in rare discrete events. All right. The proton maybe interacts two or three times before exiting the patient. Um, and, proton, and, and photons themselves actually have an infinite range. Protons, on the other hand, we're talking about protons now, are charged. So protons are charged, and so they interact with a large number of absorber nuclei simultaneously over a very long range. And this, they have three important interactions in tissue. All right. There's inelastic scattering with atomic electrons. 
Um, and this is, these are so-called soft collisions, and they are the most likely thing. The most likely thing is the proton is unaltered from its trajectory, and it kicks off an electron, which then goes on to cause further excitation and ionization, and uh, so on and so forth, the concept of absorbed dose. All right. Um, the second type of interaction is elastic Coulomb scattering with absorber nuclei. Now, this deflects protons from the path. Uh, these are largely unimportant for what I'm going to talk about here now, but they do end up to a broadening of the beam penumbra. Um, they do end up with a broadening of a proton beam at depth. Uh, and the final thing is uh, inelastic nuclear interactions where the proton is absorbed by the nucleus and it might kick off uh, a neutron. Now, the key thing, though, is these, these um, inelastic scattering events with atomic electrons mean that protons are constantly slowing down along their path. And that's the key thing I want to draw your attention to, this continuously slowing down of the protons. And on top of that, if we look at a, a very complicated formula for the, um, the mass collision stopping power, which is the rate at which energy is lost into traversing a slab of absorber, uh, absorber thick, uh, one centimeter thick. Sorry, let's say that again. If we look at the mass collision stopping power for a proton, which is the amount of energy lost in traversing a slab of absorber one centimeter thick with a mass of one gram, this function blows up as the protons slow down and go to zero velocity. So as the protons stop, they actually cause most energy deposition. And that's a really important thing. So they're continuously slowing down and they cause most of the damage as they get to the end of their track. And this leads to something called the Bragg peak. All right. And this is um, hopefully you can see that you know, the dose with depth starts off very low. And as the protons get to the end of their range in tissue, the, the, uh, we have a spike in the, the, the damage that the protons cause to, uh, or the, the, the dose that's deposited to tissue. Hopefully you can see immediately that this has some uh, dose metric advantage over our photon beam, which looks something like that in tissue. The problem is this by itself isn't, is actually too narrow to treat a tumor. So what we need to do is we need to artificially introduce multiple energies into our proton beam. Uh, and the way we do that is by uh, introducing some sort of degrader into the beam, which uh, no knocks the proton energy down. And we end up with a superposition of, of multiple Bragg peaks. And this leads to something called the spread out Bragg peak, which can actually be used to, to, to treat tumors. Once we have a spread out Bragg peak, then really the advantage in front of the tumor is rather lost, but we still retain the, the, the distal characteristics. So this is, a, this is a figure showing you that, that in slightly more detail. With, a, with protons, we, we have a high dose region just at the tumor. With x-rays, we have a continuous drop off with dose with depth. And it's always fun to look at dose distributions, protons versus photons, because they just do look so much more, so much better. This, is a, this on the left here is for thymic cancer, which is um, a small organ in the upper chest above the heart, below the breastbone. Uh, this is the proton depth dose distribution. You can see that the high dose region is more or less entirely uh, conformed to, to the lesion that we're trying to treat uh, with very good heart and lung and breast sparing. Whereas the, the inverse planned photon treatment, on the other hand, still has the high dose region where we want it to be, but there's lots of low dose in, in other areas of the patient anatomy. Uh, this is another example here, which is cranial irradiation, um, and this 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 uh, this is the inverse planned um, photon plan uh, at, on the right, uh, and this is a proton plan on the left. And this one here is for treatment of the oropharynx, and you can hopefully you get the picture. This one's kind of nice because it shows you the uh, the difference graph, so it shows you areas where um, the proton plan is low, uh, but the photon plan is high. So Clearly, there are some advantages with protons uh, in terms of the dose distribution that you can deliver to the patient. And this is another final example. This time, we're, we're looking at prostate cancer here. Um, you can see that with the inverse planned photon plan, which is these two here, we end up with a very large low dose bath, and there's lots of tissue that's being irradiated to uh, reasonably to, to, to a low dose. Uh, whereas with protons, we can spare all of this because of the nature of the depth, depth dose deposition. How do you accelerate protons? Unfortunately, um, you can't use a conventional lignite for protons, and that's because of the mass difference. Uh, protons are approximately 2,000 times heavier than electrons. Um, but we do employ 
uh, the same idea. We accelerate protons by giving them a little kick se several times. Uh, this is usually done using something called a, a cyclotron or a synchrotron. Now, a cyclotron, uh, you might have encountered this in your A-level physics. We have, we have, two, um, we have a, a magnetic field uh, between two Ds, so-called because they look like Ds, um, and there's a, an oscillating potential difference supplied between the Ds, uh, and the, the, the protons will move in an orbit, and as they cross the Ds, they get a little kick of energy, and this causes the orbital radius to increase each time they make a revolution around the cyclotron. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because we are slightly running out of time. Um, I did want to do a little bit of maths that was related to uh, charged particle orbits uh, in a magnetic field. Because um, the, the key thing is that for uh, non-relativistic cyclotrons, the, the frequency uh, is completely determined by um, the magnetic field strength. But as we get into the realm of, of um, relativistic particles, we end up having to modulate that in order to in order to keep the um, in order to yeah sorry for non-relativistic particles the angular frequency is completely determined by the magnetic field strength for relativistic particles we end up having to change the frequency of our oscillating potential between the two d's to match the fact that as as the protons get to higher energy more of the energy is going into mass rather than the velocity gains um, or we end up having to uh, so we can either modulate the rf or we can modulate the magnetic field strength. And this leads to either the concept of an isochronous cyclotron or a synchro cyclotron. Um, the other, th the, sorry, I've really uh, run out of time here, which is a great shame. But uh, the other way of accelerating protons is through the CERN style accelerator, uh, which are not limited by relat uh, relativity. Uh, they can achieve a higher maximum energy. Uh, and that's something called a synchrotron, which you're gonna have to look up in your own time, I'm afraid, because I don't have time to go over it. Um, Accelerators tend to be quite massive structures, and this means that proton beam therapy is extremely expensive, and that's mainly because of, well, you know, the cyclotron real estate. They take up huge, great big, uh, vast reams of space. Um, and on top of that, there are some disadvantages to proton therapy, and that is that heterogeneities have a massive impact on the proton range. And this means that, as shown in this figure here, your Bragg peak um, can be seriously displaced by volumes of gas. All right. So this is an example shown here. It's a simulation where um, we've we've uh, we've artificially introduced a large volume of, of rectal gas in the patient's rectum. Um, and that has meant that the Bragg peak has moved way beyond where we wanted it to. And we've ended up irradiating um, healthy tissue to to a high dose. Uh, and this is important. All right. This is this is this is a key thing. This is this is not so much of an effect for photons, but it's a very important effect for protons. And this is where we arrive at the, the concept of dose to an image rather than dose to a patient. Because the truth is, all right, as good as our dose distributions look because of our patient model, patients move. Uh, um, there's, there's patient motion has many time scales, all right? There's uh, breathing or digestion, organ filling, and over like, the course of treatment, they might undergo some weight loss, possibly some weight gain, uh, the tumor might shrink if the radiation's working. Um, and this, this means that the CT scan that we've done all our modeling on is actually only a snapshot of the patient in time. So what we really want to do is we want to adapt our optimized radiotherapy plan according to the anatomy of the day. And this is where we get into the paradigm of adaptive radiotherapy, which is where instead of bending the patient to match the optimized treatment plan, we're going to bend the treatment plan to match the patient. All right? And I should stress at this point, we do have tools to account for gross setup shifts uh, already on, on, in conventional Linux. All right? So this is, a, this is a prototype onboard imaging device. We spoke about this. This is a, this is a treatment gantry, um, and this is a, a, a KV imaging tube which allows us to create a cone beam CT of the patient according to the daily setup and then we have software that lets us match that daily cone beam to um, the planning CT and apply a shift and this is great for correcting um, gross setup errors and making sure that the patient is in the same place they were when we did the planning but unfortunately cone beam CT image quality is just incredibly poor all right it's just not where we'd want it to be this is a this is a bowel gas artifact uh, this is the planning CT on the left, and this is what the radiographers end up matching to. And I, I can't see anything in there at all. 
So what we really want is we want online MRI. And this is where we're at now. We've got treatment machines that couple a, a linear accelerator and the, um, the wonderful imaging capacity of MRI all in one treatment unit. And you can see here, so this is, this is a cone beam CT uh, and this is an MRI. And just look at the definition there that you get. Just look at the quality of image that you get from, from MRI. You can see so much more anatomical detail. Uh, and this is an example here from, from, uh, from prostate cancer. So this is a CT on the left. And this is two, uh, so the other key thing about MRI is it has many different contrasts available. With CT, you get what you're given. There's only one contrast. With MRI, you can create multiple contrasts. So this is, um, this you know, here, this is supposed to be the prostate, which has been delineated here. I don't know about you, but that just looks like a continuous gray smudge to me. Whereas on these MRI images, you can, in, you can clearly see where the target is. And so we arrive at MRI guided radiotherapy, which is, a, as I said, a, a coupling of a linear accelerator and um, uh, uh, an MRI scanner. This is me outside the one at the Christie. Uh, and this is really a, a kind of, this, for me, this is a game changer. All right, this is, we, we image daily and we optimize the plan daily according to the daily imaging, all right? And hopefully this will lead to smaller margins, lower rates of toxicity. Uh, we can, because we can see what it is we're radiating perfectly, we can start to escalate the dose or de-escalate if the treatment's working. We can use MRI to monitor the treatment response uh, according to what's been, what's been delivered previously. Um, it, it gives us the ability to know with more certainty, know in inverted commas, uh, the dose that was delivered to the patient. Um, and because it's diagnostic quality imaging at each fraction, uh, we can explore the possibility of functional MRI to, so that we can gain uh, how, how, how monitor how the treatment is, um, is, is having its effect. Uh, and on top with MRI, there's also no com concomitant imaging dose. That is the, 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 the way MRI images are produced has no, uh, no known side effects that we're aware of. But still, in the current market, you can get four conventional Linux for the price of one MRI coupled Linux. Right? They tend to be quite low throughput. Um, they tend to be quite low patient throughput. Um, they tend to be quite low patient throughput machines uh, with treatment times in excess of one hour. Uh, whereas with a C arm, you can get the patient in and out within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the couches are quite uncomfortable. So lying there for an hour is not something that you really want to be doing every day. Um, but that's principally because the imaging takes so long with MRI. The, the, the cone beam CT is acquired uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the MRI imaging, um, you might have multiple imaging sets and that might last quite a while longer. Uh, and the other thing as well is that although we can reduce the treatment margins, this is possibly a double-edged sword because we don't really, we don't really understand, um, Oh, how shall I how shall I how shall I explain this? If we if we decrease the margins, it might be that we are irradiating something that has an impact on tumor control that we just don't know about yet. We don't really fully understand what it is. Uh, we don't really fully understand the model that relates the dose distribution to the patient outcome. So clearly, there are some still some much more important questions to be answered, and much 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 more exciting work to be done. But at this point, I have to hand it back to my uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, and hand it back to you for any questions you might have. But before I do that, I just want to say a quick couple of thank yous. Thank you to the Cavendish for having me. Uh, a thank you to Patrick McDermott, Lara Burgess, Ken Peach, Anita Anthony, Hugo Palmans, Russell Thomas and Nigel Lee at the MPL, um, the Australian Primary Standards Laboratories, John Allen at Electa, Francesco Tom Tomasino, um, and I'm really sorry, but I can't pronounce your name, but the, 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 the lovely chap at Radiology Key who have all helped me with the content of these slides and all the other references that I've used in this talk. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing. I hope that was interesting. Great. Thank you very, very much, Liam. A really informative talk. And actually, uh, it, what struck me is the, the real depth of thinking there is into into radiotherapy and how much ev every aspect of it is just is really the, the amount of detail in the planning and thought that goes into it it's just astonishing and um, we've got a we've got a number of questions here on the um coming on the q a uh here's the first one for you is radiotherapy better for some kinds of tumors than others and um, what kind of tumors respond best yeah um so i think 
you know, it's unfortunate statistic that something like one in two of us after uh, born after 1960 will uh, be affected by cancer at some point in our lives. Uh, a further about a further half of them will have radiotherapy as part of their treatment. Um, I, it's it, in my experience, it's very rare that it's used as a standalone treatment. It's usually used in conjunction with other things such as chemo um, or and, and surgery being the the main uh, source of disease control in most in most cases. Um, radiotherapy is very good for for superficial lesions, so skin cancers. Uh, it might be used on its own for that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a mixed bag, really. It, it, forms, it forms a constituent part of a large number of patient pathways. But yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question here. If photons were better controlled into the tumour, would they be better at treating the tumour than protons? Well, yes. Uh, but I think the thing is, is the technology is such that we are we're hitting against the the um, you know you can't beat physics no matter how hard you try you can't get out of that game so we are kind of at the limits of what we can do with photons now which is why we're exploring other things like protons and other light ions um, we've got we've got the inverse planning we've got very good machines that deliver uh, the dose distribution that we want with good reliability um, but you can't beat the fact that that the fundamental physics of photons in in tissue is such that um, we have to in order to deliver the dose to the tumor and not anything else, we have to first pass through other tissue and that will that will have to deposit some dose. We can't ever beat that. So we are, I think, approaching the limit of, of what we can do there. Um, the, the main sort of game change changes are what we do to reduce the, the uncertainty in that delivery, which is the delivery, which is the imaging that I was talking about at the end there with the MRI scanner. Um, and and also exploring other types of particle that, that, that could be used to deposit dose. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm at bad, just to, you're talking at the end about in uh, work using the using the scanners in, uh, in well in collaboration with MRI scanners in, with radiotherapy, which is something uh, it's astonishing seeing that happening li live. You know, it's, it's, um, we're, the question is about MRI imaging times will will they speed up as the technology becomes more widespread yeah they definitely will um they're they're they're, they're clever physicists the ones that work in mri uh, and there's all sorts of there's all sorts of um techniques that you can use to uh, to speed up the acquisition time the other thing that really slows down a a fraction of mri guided radiotherapy at the moment is just experience they're quite quite new techniques everyone's sort of uh, making sure that it's safe they want to take their time um, on top of all the imaging, if you're if you're if you're re-optimizing the plan according to the daily anatomy, then there's an awful lot of calculation that needs to be done. There's basically a lot of overheads, all right. Um, and with things like artificial intelligence, uh, increased computing power, and as ex user experience grows, that'll definitely condense down. It'll definitely become more viable. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um... Great. Uh, any books? Any book recommendations? We've, we've clearly got a. You've inspired somebody here, so to, to go yeah. to the reading. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know what? Rather than a book, actually, I, I would like to recommend uh, getting yourself signed up with IPEM, the Institute of Physics and Engineering Medicine, and then you should get free access to uh, a, a magazine called Scope, which is uh, distributed to medical physicists. Uh, up and down the country i believe it's free i'm not going to quote me on that i think it's free for affiliate members um and that ha always has some very insightful stuff but if you want to if you want an excellent textbook on radiotherapy there's one called or, or or on medical physics in general there's a a manchester series um called uh nuclear physics uh i'm just going to quickly google who that is um who that is that the name of that author because i can't remember uh Bear with me a sec. Yes, so that is called uh, Nuclear Physics Principles and Applications. It's a Manchester Physics series, uh, and that is by John Lilly. So hopefully you can all look that up on Amazon. That's got a very nice chapter which covers a lot of medical physics topics, not just radiotherapy, but also nuclear medicine, radiation safety. Uh, generally, very well, um, you know, aimed at the sort of undergraduate, at a sort of A level coming into undergraduate. Very approachable. Uh, if you if radiotherapy is your thing. Um, when you join the profession, you need to get Patrick McDermott's um, tutorials in radiotherapy physics. 
that's probably that that'd be my book recommendations great thank you very much um now just looking at the, the clock here we do have some we've got some more questions here but i think i need to try and make sure we finish promptly at seven so um thank you very very much liam really interesting and really insightful talk so a lot a lot there to actually to, to ponder and go away and hopefully um a lot of you do, people that are do, doing currently doing a level physics some really good steer to actually go, go, go and discover radiotherapy is a lot it's a really interesting area and even hopefully inspired a lot of people there um just um to remind everybody the 20 uh the cpc 2022 talks they're on the um they're on the cambridge physics center web, website uh thursday january the 20th high power laser photonics by professor bill o'neill uh 22nd of february why infrastructure matters a lot of the one for the for the civil engineers there dr jennifer uh, i can't remember pronounce the surname but i'm sure it's on the website and uh 20 march 22nd exoplanets uh and looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets was a, a big range of physics there to, but i'm sure that if we were if we were live in the um um in in the cavendish okay we'd have a huge rapturous round of applause for liam at this stage okay but for it reminds me to say a big thank you for for, for talking tonight Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm just I'm just rapidly answering some of the Q&A questions, actually. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.